Marcus and I met a lot of years ago when I was teaching a competitive color guard that he was performing in. I think it, we met, it was 1996 to be exact. <laughs> I was going out with some friends and um, I was trying to decide what to wear. My friend said, you should wear a really nice shirt because you might meet the woman of your dreams. And we were walking and I saw her through the window and I said, she's the one. I met David at the gym. I was working out. I saw him and the secluded one over there and got to know him and worked his way from there. I would say it was lust at first sight and love <laughs> did come though. <laughs> love came. Yeah. We met at the gym. One day we sat and started talking in the um, sauna and the next day we ran to each other in the locker room. I passed as he was coming out, I was going in and we said hi and then he asked me out. The story goes two different ways. <laughs> um, yeah, he definitely showed an interest in me. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we, yeah, we hung out, we were friends for a while, we dated very briefly and then we stayed friends for many years and dated other people. Yeah. And then uh, all of a sudden something just clicked and we instantly both knew we needed to be a couple. He was like my best friend before he was ever anything else, you know. We had a really good friendship before we kind of took the plunge into a relationship, so that's kind of how it worked. It seems like forever and a day ago that we met, um, it was kind of a odd set of circumstances that I went online one night. We were It was an AOL chat room for same-sex guys in Fort Lauderdale. His profile actually seemed somewhat normal, um, which is exactly what I IM'd him, and saying, hey, you sound like one of the only normal ones in the room tonight. You seem kind of interesting. Check out my profile. If you like what you have to see, get back to me. I mean, basically, we were both married when we met at the gym. Initially, we were married to women. You know, I mean, I'd always had these feelings for many years, but had suppressed them. So it was a very difficult time, you know. I had to really think about myself for once. For too long, I tried to live my parents' dream, you know, everybody else's dream, but my own. When I first saw him, I thought he was pretty hot. <laughs> I mean, he had long blonde hair, and I was instantly attracted to him. I remember I, I didn't want to call him too quickly. So I think two days went by and he called me and I was like, yes. I guess it took her about a week to call me back. And then she had like 50 billion questions. She thought I was a teenager, which made me very happy. And, um, you know, wanted to know how long I was single and various other things. And I passed all the questions and here we are 10 years later. I'm originally from New York. I worked um, in New York as a firefighter for a bit. Yeah, I was, I was a, at the World Trade Center uh, that morning bef before, uh, before the second plane came in. It was obviously a very sad time of, uh, of my life. Um, I, I, did, I, don't, I, I wouldn't say I handled it very well, and hence the, some of the reason of why I, I left the fire department. Moved, moved to Florida, yeah. Um, Q and John Duffy. Met John. We met playing softball. Mm -hmm. I knew I wanted to be a parent regardless if it was with someone else or by myself. I knew that I wanted to be a parent. I don't know. I, I, for me, I think a lot of it has to do with my childhood. Um, I didn't have a substantial father figure in my life. The point I decided to be a parent was I, I always knew I was going to be a parent and wanted to be a parent. When Paul and I got together, we discussed it. I said, you know, this is going to be a part of my future. And then it took three years of uh, me saying, this is happening, this is happening. We had talked about being parents prior to us ever getting involved. Um, and it just never really happened for either one of us. So we just kind of made peace with this was the way our life was going to be. And we got dogs. I knew I was gay at 13, and I've wanted to be a parent as far back as I can remember, probably even before than I wanted kids. I've always loved being around kids, taking care of them. I have a sister that's seven years younger, so always having a smaller person around me was natural. We knew we were both interested in kids from probably the first time that we dated. He mentioned he loved kids and wanted kids, and I mentioned I wanted kids, so we knew that that was going to happen. That was one of the things that we wanted was be fathers. We wanted to have a kid. The topic of having a kid came up on our very first date. He brought it up and I thought, so not happening, so not interested in having a child. And I 
thought, oh, this is gonna take a little bit of time, but it's gonna happen at some point. So I, I essentially brushed it you know, underneath the rug for a little bit and kind of said, all right, well, it's gonna take some time, but we'll see. I definitely wanted children more, maybe more than Paul. Um, I don't know that he wanted them less. He just didn't know that he was had that much love and was capable of doing it. Yeah, that, that's the way I see it. I, I mean, I grew up the fact that always kind of believing that the marriage kid thing was not going to be a part of my story, you know. And then when things started changing in the world and I started changing and involving like my own feelings and opinions. Then it started looking like, hey, I could actually do this. But before, when I was growing up and as a kid or even in college, I just never thought kids were, was, would be in, in the story for me. Well, it was more of a conversation we had on our second date. I walk into his house for the second date and it's, um, yeah, by the way, I want to put this up front. Um, I want to have children. If you don't, um, yeah, there's the door. Don't let it hit you in the butt on the way out. So I've always wanted children, um, so as long as I can remember. The idea of not having children, actually, my age was, was kind of hard on me. Um, with my ex-wife, you know, we didn't have any children. Being on the same page with children definitely had a, uh, had a lasting effect. You know, it says a lot about a guy when they really want to love a child. It really does say a lot. It's becoming more acceptable for gay couples to foster. There are no laws that prohibit a gay individual from adopting or foster parenting. However, there are attitudes and practices that have the effect of discriminating against our families. That said, there are now eight states that have actual anti-discrimination laws in place in foster and adoption care practices. I did know that you could foster um, a, a child, but it was always one of those things that you had to hide it. There was somebody that I knew who was fostering a child, and his partner had to be set up in a separate bedroom with other pictures of just him, and that was, that was his room, that was his space, and then this was us over here, and I was the one that was fostering, and he's just kind of the one that was living here kind of thing. <laughs> we really didn't. Yeah know that we could foster. We All we knew is that we wanted to start a family. Frankie just wanted to help kids. You know, his motive is just to help kids. And really, that's where we were at when, when the journey began. I always thought I was going to be a parent. And I knew I was always gay. And I had the discussion with my father. And my dad was like, well, how are you going to be able to be a parent? You know, this was back in the day when I was 18. And I said, I don't know. So then it kind of came off the shelf because we really didn't think that gay people can be parents. We didn't really realize that we had the ability to adopt until we went to one of the Pride Festivals. And there was one of the workers there at our agency uh, that manned a booth and she had told us about the possibility of fostering a child. It, it was just thinking that we, we weren't able to legally, you know, that, and that people didn't want us to in general. Society didn't want us to. They weren't going to facilitate that for us. Science has evolved everything to where we can be inseminated, to where, you know, a, a whole bunch of, bunch of things, and now we can be parents, or even being foster parents. Did I know if it was possibly for, for gays to foster? Um, I did just because I'd followed kind of the news and I knew that there was a lot of uh, controversy about it and um, several years back I remember them talking about how there's all these kids in foster care and then there's all these gay couples that wanted to adopt and they weren't allowed, letting them or foster. So I knew the laws had changed and the rules kind of had changed so I was aware of it. Nearly every person involved in the foster care movement says that the biggest obstacle to reducing the number of children that are aging out of the system is the availability of loving homes. There are about 400,000 people, young people in the foster care system in the United States at any given time. And there are about 100,000 of them that are available for adoption. There are estimates that would suggest that if the discriminatory practices, beliefs, in some cases even laws, were not there. There are enough LGBT couples to completely eliminate that number of people, those young people from aging out of the system. 
to become foster parents, we had to go through a whole process of going to classes for 13 weeks. We had to have our entire life scrutinized. They had to come into our house and make sure that nothing was gonna fall on the kid's head. They really went out of their way to make it very difficult in many ways. But, you know, wanting to protect the child, but at the same time, wanting to make sure that, you know, the kid was gonna be in safe hands as a temporary caregiver. When we decided, or finally, got to the place where we were both on board with um, becoming foster parents. I had us signed up for class in less than a week uh, and just jumped into it before he could get cold feet. The foster care class wasn't really difficult for us. Um, it was difficult getting time off of work, but we made that happen and um, we actually really enjoyed it. Um, Some of the stories were heartbreaking, but other than that, we enjoyed it. We learned a lot. Uh, we learned a lot about how our system works. The woman who was teaching the class was very charismatic. Um, she was very pro-gay uh, foster parents and she was very excited to have so many gay couples in the room and that was a lot of what really got us on the train because it became this agency wants us here. This agency is actively looking for gay people here. And I thought that, you know, okay, I'm gonna at least go to the next class. Basically, it's a 12-week crash course on how to be a parent, how to deal with the foster care system, what you're gonna encounter, learning what you wanna do, and really a chance for the foster agencies to weed out who is not gonna make the cut. When you're fostering, it's not about you. It's always about the child and the child's needs because the kid's being taken out of a very bad situation and they need a family that's gonna be stable, loving, and supportive for them. And your needs need to go on the back burner. When we were taking the foster care uh, classes, I was actually halfway through to a master's in social work at the time. And I had just gone through childhood development as part of the curriculum. So a lot of it was validating things that I knew, but one of the things um, that concerned me, and of course it came up in the foster parent classes, was attachment disorders and reactive attachment disorder uh, specifically. I think what scared me most about the class was the attachment and then not being able to follow through with that. Like, was I gonna be able to handle that? You listen to new cases and it really plays with your emotions throughout the classes. Uh, I think that was the hardest thing because, in, I mean, we, you can learn CPR, you can, you can fence your pool, you know, you can baby-proof your house, that's easy. But the emotions, it is, it is there. What scared us, scared me the most was maybe, it was around class five, and it was like the psychotropic meds and, possibly having a kid who could have mental issues and we wouldn't find out until later. And then when we got closer to the end of the class, we all you know, start, had to start getting a crib and getting a room together. That's when I, we, it started moving really fast for us. And I think that part scared me because I'm like, this could happen really soon, sooner than we think, you know? The class that kind of touched me the most or really like made an impact on me was when they talked about some of the um, real life situations and what got the kids into care. And I realized then in class, my role was a lot bigger than, than what I originally thought it was gonna be. I mean, um, you know, some of these kids, they just, it's just heartbreaking, the reason that they're there. And the big thing about it is that, you know, one thing I'd like everybody to know and people that ask me is, these kids are not, like, they're not permanently broken. You know, they're not flawed in any way, they just, they were just in a bad situation and they needed to remove from that situation and um, that really made an impact. You would go in one night thinking, yeah, I can do this and sometimes you come out of there like, maybe, maybe I can't do it. You know, okay. the, the, the classes were really eye-opening, you know, um, some of it was parenting classes. Some of it were, was about safety and security. Um, mm -hmm. Very, very informative um, and, and, and scary at the same time. One of the main things that scared me in the classes was separation. They had three separate classes on how to separate from the child, which is a very intimidating and heartbreaking thought. You know, right. anybody who I talk to about fostering who's scared is scared of separating from a child they fall in love with. And it's natural. This is about the child. 
This isn't about the love that you've always wanted in a family, you've always wanted. This is about helping a child. When we went to foster care, I found out that they didn't have any problem with us being gay, that they had several foster parents that were gay. And um, they kept telling us that the goal is not adoption. You're not going to get to adopt these kids. You're just fostering and that's it. In the classes, they're constantly reminding you that the goal of foster care is reunification with the biological parents. Mm -hmm. That's the goal. Sometimes it becomes a permanent situation. Sometimes it's a temporary situation. But, you know, just that whole idea that you can really make an impact in a kid's life. I mean, you know, it gives, I don't know, it felt like I had purpose. If, if down the road the child, you know, doesn't have a safe place to go to, and um, I've been fostering, I am fully open to take that child in. I think that all parents should have to take a class like that. Yeah, the Even minute, if it's the a minute you version, get pregnant, you should have to take some kind of class like this. I mean, it, it can was, do nothing but help, you know? It, it can, yeah, absolutely. The, the stuff that they covered in the class and just with the day-to-day -day care of a child and the different ways of disciplining and what's appropriate and what's not appropriate, I mean, everyone has their own ideas, but it definitely opens your eyes to a whole other way of thinking and whether you choose to go down that road or you choose to go down a different road, at least you've been exposed to something new. Going through foster care class definitely makes you a better yes, parent. Yes, I think it makes you a better parent. You know, the normal straight couple um, could really benefit from classes. When I came out of it, I thought this is something like everybody, every parent should have to, to take, uh, especially learning kind of how to like behave, uh, behavior management and things like that. It, it is funny that, um, you know, straight people can just have a child and and that's it, the child's theirs and, and uh, you know, if they're able to. But with us, we had, to, we had to jump through the hoops, you know. But I was, I've always been willing to jump through the hoops because I'm so grateful for the opportunity that I didn't know existed. For us, it didn't really matter about the age or gender. We were asking for six weeks to 18 months, two years about. Fortunately for us, we essentially wanted the same thing. We wanted one that was old enough that they weren't completely, you know, enabled to take care of themselves, but at the same time weren't old enough that they'd be coming with, you know, a whole bunch of baggage. We, we said we preferred a girl. We thought that an infant would be better um, because uh, we wouldn't need to worry so much about what their background was and you know how they might have been traumatized or neglected. Once we were licensed, we immediately got phone calls asking for placements. Now immediately, we're talking an hour? Yeah, maybe? an hour after being licensed. That doesn't, that's not an hour after getting our license. That's an hour after them saying, hey, we're going to mail your license in the mail now. When she came home from the hospital, she was just under four weeks old. She had some issues when she was born and she had to stay in the NICU for about three and a half weeks. He was three months old when he came to our house, to our care. Right. Well, Sarah came to us when she was seven months old. And at that point, we were told that prospect for adoption on the case was probably good. Nikki was 18 months old when we first got her. Admittedly, it was a little rocky the first uh, couple of months. She was very, very scared. She had no idea what was happening to her. I think I may have been scared, but my elation kind of overrode all of that. And just this, this natural drive just to care for her was amazing. I wasn't scared about becoming a parent or a gay foster parent or however society wants to label it. It's just, to me, it was just natural progression of you have a child and you just do it. You know, no more nerves than anybody else would have. We weren't really scared because at the NICU, the nurses there were fantastic. They kind of taught us how to do things, changing diapers, bathing, what happens, you know, if they, they're crying or, you know, just kind of, they kind of walked us through the whole thing. And I was scared to death. We were the baby scared to death. Thank God for Google. Oh my gosh, I don't know what I would do if I didn't know how to Google how to wash a baby, how to feed a baby. It was good. They say they don't make instruction manuals for babies. Check out Google. Check out Google. 
It's all there. The first few hours of having an infant in the home was a little stressful, a little confusing, like, all right, now what do we do, you know? Thank God I was I was in nursing school at the time, and we called one of my nursing buddies, and she came over. She's like, the first thing we have to do is get a, a bassinet. And I was like, great, okay, we're gonna get a bassinet. We have to get a bassinet. We have to get a bassinet, but what's what is a bassinet? <laughs> When Sarah first came to us, I think after she brought the first couple of childhood illnesses home from daycare to us, there, there was part of me that was concerned I, because then we in turn would get them. And that stopped after the first couple of months. She would still get sick, but we wouldn't. But I thought, I can't be sick all the time like this. What are we gonna do, you know? But at the same time, you know, you fall in love and you, you realize that parenting is just a different set of problems. Anything that's rewarding is also challenging, usually. The, th well, the thing is, is that when we first brought her home, I mean, she put it very gently, we were a little freaked out because we're two single women who, you know, our lives did not evolve around anything other than what, you know, biking, hiking, kayaking, dinners, we friends. Had, we had laundry piled up. The house was a tornado. I mean, we really, honey, you got to tell them. We were a little freaked out in the beginning because we were not used to children at all. I never thought that it was too difficult and that we might consider giving the baby back. I did think that to be a single parent mm. must be very, very challenging. And I don't know how a single parent could do it. Yeah, I remember the first night that I got up and held him in my arms and fed him his first bottle. And I looked into his little eyes and he looked back at me with his blue eyes. And I knew it was, it was just love. I melted right there and I knew I'd do anything for that child. My family told me I was nuts. <laughs> no, um, my family was very supportive of the idea of be me becoming a father. They all said, you're gonna make a great dad. But at the same time, they all kind of were like, are you sure that you really wanna be a father? Are you willing to take on that responsibility? You know, is this really something that you really want? And you know, in a way it was almost having to kind of convince them that yes, this is something that not only did I want, but that we wanted. That was uh, my main concern, was what society would think about, you know, two men raising a baby. And uh, so far, it, society's basically came out and said, you know, it's, it's great, for the most part. I'm sure there are people out there that I have not met yet that would be totally against it. And probably some of my friends would be against it from my previous life, my wife. But um, right now, I haven't seen anything. The biggest problem for LGBT couples to form their families um, and to participate fully in the social fabric of the American culture still remains bias and stigma um, throughout many levels of, of our society. My family, they love it. I mean, it was just like tears. It's like, that, that'll be great. It's a great thing that you're doing. You know, my friends as well, they all supported us. Luckily for us, we have only experienced positive moments from different people in public, and people of complimenting our family, being excited about our family, curious about our family. We haven't experienced anything negative. You know, for the people that are still running around, you know, doused in hate, that's on them. Our friends were blown away, and they pretty much have been supportive throughout, but I think that they were more shocked than even our family members were. Since having a child, our friends have definitely changed. Uh, some of the ones prior have stuck around, and we see them every once in a while and visit, but now we have a huge network of, you know, gay dads and with kids, and it's been just incredible. Some of the obstacles that we, that kind of came to mind is family. Um, I was less concerned about his family and how they would um, take it and kind of accept it. I was a little more concerned about my family. They're a little bit more traditional. I don't think that they even thought that I'd ever want children. And then bringing in a child that would be a foster kid that may not stick around, I was afraid that they would not kind of open their hearts. And then I knew that we were open to any race child, so that was another element that I felt like my family was pretty open-minded, but I, you know, it's still something I didn't 
no, I didn't know how they'd react. Um, so that was the biggest thing. Um, for me, I think um, reaction-wise, I think would be just small-minded people um, seeing number one a gay couple, but with a, a child of a different race. I'm kind of a protective bear when it comes to my family and protecting them, and I I, I would put up with no nonsense uh, from from anybody. Nobody's ever been mean, outright mean. No. People have been surprised. People have been curious and had questions. I, it's, it's usually, for, for me, older white women, like old women, and they're like, oh, she's so cute, you know, where's her mom? Sarah got placed, they were Leaf, huh? ecstatic. Mm -hmm. huh? uh, All about it then. They actually, my parents actually drove here from Louisiana twice to see her. My family's been extremely supportive through the entire process, and, um, and so have our friends. I think that when I mentioned it initially, I could sense some skepticism as to you know, whether or not they thought it was possible or we were aiming too high or we were too excited about something or you know, um, that wasn't gonna happen. Within a week of her coming into our life, several of our friends that we used to hang out with disappeared from our life. They did not want anything to do with kids, did not want to be around her, did not want to hear her. Our new lifestyle does not fit for some of our old friends, you know. Some gay men love children and want to be parents and be around them and other gay men are very used to their independence and while they might like children, they don't necessarily want to spend a lot of time around them. You know, I don't really feel as though we get strange looks from people. I think that if this was 10 years ago, we would have gotten a lot more strange looks. When we told our friends that we were fostering, People were supportive. People were shocked. I think secretly they were more shocked. Secretly they me. were shocked. <laughs> you know, you get a face like this, like, oh, that's great. At first they thought we were talking about a puppy. We would oh, say, yeah. we're getting a baby. Oh, yeah. You know, gay people, are, they puppy? call their, their dogs their babies, so. I got that a lot. How old's your puppy? Yeah. What kind of breed? Like, <laughs> human? I think uh, most people admire and respect us, and a lot of people wish that we were their parents <laughs> because we do come with a lot of love and a lot of good stuff. I think that being in the gay community, period, we all rally around each other. And I really like it because a lot of our gay friends have children, you know, they're mostly men. We're like the token lesbians. And so for us, it'll be good to be able to be a female figure to these little children that are growing up, you know, with two dads and, and vice versa. The piece that we struggle with though is, and I think it's important to say, is that there's still a lot of people in the gay community that kind of give us that look like, you know, this, what are they doing? Like, you know, and so it's weird. We're, we don't really fit in in the gay, the, the gay culture. We don't really fit in with the straight mom and dad soccer mom kind of thing. So we have kind of our own little thing. It's, it's kind, of, kind of interesting. The people in the gay community that we meet, I feel like we give them hope. A lot of people, especially when we first got Zachary, a lot of people didn't have parenting on their radar as a gay person. I, no I notice some people staring, and you know they're judging you one way or the other, but it's difficult to ascertain whether they're looking at you with approval, with disapproval, or maybe just looking at you trying to process it. Yeah, pe some people judge us, uh, some people are delighted, and, and maybe we can change other people's minds. Well, I've been a member of the LGBT community for the last couple of decades, have been an activist for uh, at least that long, and I think there's been tremendous change. It's obviously been very positive on the marriage front, and that's a good thing because marriage confers with it many benefits. People are starting to look at us and starting to look at our families as more similar than dissimilar has made a tremendous effect. We really do want to adopt our foster child if and when he goes to adoption. Um, and we are actually close to that point uh, in the case. So um, it's looking pretty good in favor of us, but that could change on a dime. And we really have to be careful with getting our hopes up too high. I don't, I don't know who spoils her more because I will tell her no, but you'll never tell her no, but I buy her way more things. Uh 
yeah, out of control with the, the, the dresses and the bows. I mean, this is why we had to have a girl because I right. needed to have a girl. And I was fine with that, completely fine with that. We had a lot of, wow, it really looks like she's your daughter. She looks like a combination of the two of you. Or we get the other flip side of the coin. It looks like she's his daughter and he had her with a white lady with blonde hair. <laughs> <laughs> I'm called Papa and uh, Dave is called Daddy. Nikki is very outgoing. She's very personable, affectionate, and caring. Nikki is now four years old. She's legally adopted. The papers are signed. The ink is dry. Now it's a brand new chapter in our life. It's the chapter of us really being a family together. Zachary is now three and a half years old. Um, we brought him home when he was 19 days old. We adopted him when he was 18 months old. He's very healthy very intelligent, does very well at school. He calls me Daddy Frankie. And I'm Daddy Johnny. My life now is the life of every other parent. I mean, we get up, Zachary has a bowl of cereal, we get him off to school, and we go through our lives, we pick him up, we have dinner, and then it's night-night time, you know? And it's colored with <laughs> what happens when you have a three and a half year old. So our house isn't as clean. Our laundry is not always as done, but you know, it's a blast. You know, one of the things that I've learned about the whole foster care system is that you just have to be in the moment. You never know. Yeah. And it's so funny because people will ask me, how's it going? And it's like every week I feel like, well, I'll know at the next court date. I never know anything. Right. All I know is today she's had a great morning. She has a wonderful life right now and hopefully we'll be able to help her parents realize, you know, how to do it. Right now the mother's not equipped to take her, and if she goes back too soon, it wouldn't be to the benefit of, um, of her, the foster baby. You know, the thing about it is, too, is that for us, we've learned to trust the process, and um, we're not in charge, you know? I believe everybody has a path, and I really, truly know that about this little lady because she was placed and nobody picked her up and she ended up coming to our home. So there's a reason why we have her, and you know, it's gonna work out the way it's supposed yeah. to. And I know I say that very calmly now, and the day that they say you have to give her back, I'm probably not gonna be this calm. That's why I've learned to stay in the moment with it. Family Equality Council is a national organization. We connect, support, represent uh, LGBT-headed families across the country. We empower parents, grandparents, children of LGBT couples to advocate for themselves, and we support them and advocate for fair laws around the country. We were founded actually about 32 years ago by a group of gay dads, dads who had been in previous heterosexual marriages, and they decided they wanted to find people like themselves, and that's how Family Equality Council was started. At Gays with Kids, we help gay dads navigate fatherhood. We do this primarily by sharing stories on how gay dads are creating and raising families. Um, in addition to that, it's really our mission to make sure that every gay dad, regardless of his path to fatherhood or where he lives, feels welcome and represented. We felt that it was important to create Gays with Kids because we knew that we felt somewhat alienated from being able to connect with other gay dads. Let's face it, there are some issues. If you're a parent, it doesn't matter if you're the dad, the mom. If you're the primary caregiver, it doesn't matter if you're the grandparent, an aunt, a foster parent, etc. Some issues are universal. But the reality is that there are many issues that we gay dads have in common with each other. For example, I find that you know, since I've become a dad, I came out 20-something years ago. And I came out in a big way, and I've lived often during the last 20 years in very gay com communities. Um, but since we become dads, we're coming out almost every day. We're coming out to the kids' teachers, the principal, the pediatrician, the dentist, play dates, coming out all the time. And that's not something that I can really address or discuss with our straight peers. It's something that is an issue that really, you know, I can only really discuss it with other gay dads. And so there are numerous issues like that. And so we felt it was really important to be able to create a, 
an opportunity for gay dads to be able to share these experiences. We have a great relationship with Family Equality Council, been to Family Week, is, you know, but really depending on what you need, there's legal organizations, there's adoption agencies, foster care agencies that really work closely with the gay community. There are surrogacy agencies, fertility clinics that have a lot of experience with gay community with HIV positive men. Um, I'd say my thing is do your research. Certainly come to Gays with Kids. Our gay dad bloggers, our writers are talking about a lot of these agencies by name. Um, and just do your research. We have so many different types of stories on Gays with Kids. We've already up to about 400 articles and blog posts since we've launched. We have stories from I don't know, 25, 30 different gay dads who are blogging and they are just telling stories about you know, how they create their families, issues that come up, really anything and everything. The first six months that we had this child, I'd wake up every morning and had to think to myself, this is not my child. I love this child, but I can, you know, this is not my child. It's very difficult. But there's also nothing more rewarding than seeing this little thing that you used to hold that all it could do was stare back at you, grow into a, a, a little boy that runs around and just goes crazy. The one advice that I can give to anybody that is going to this thinking about wanting to be a foster parent is be very serious about the fact that this is what you want to do. It is the hardest thing that you will ever do in your life and you have to be prepared about the fact that you are going to live every day of your life until that day when the judge says congratulations you are a forever family that you are going to live under the constant fear that somebody's going to that a relative's going to come along that they didn't know about that something's going to happen and that at a moment's notice you could get that call have a bag packed that we're coming to get the kid and they're going to be leaving you most of the time your first placement doesn't stay most of the time your first placement gets reunified and I think it gives you an opportunity to sit down with your partner or if you're doing it as a single person to really say is this the life I want for me? Am I ready to do this for the next 18 years? And I think it gives you a time to press pause and I hate talking about it like this but from a financial standpoint it is um, way less of a burden than surrogacy or adoption. It's different. There's definitely expenses, don't get it wrong, but it's not, it's not nearly that level. Fostering, it, your heart is in it, no, no matter what. But from a practical standpoint in parenting and wanting to be a parent, it's, um, it's a wonderful test ground. You know exactly what the both of you want as a unit uh, before you proceed. Raising any kid, your own kid, a foster kid, it's a lot of work, you know? Yeah. If you're ready to take the plunge, take it. And when you're going through foster care, think of it like a team. It's important to think of all of the people because there is a lot of people that you're gonna be involved with. You have to think of it like a team. And wherever anybody falls short of any skill or anything they're supposed to be doing, you pick up that skill if you have it. You know, and the purpose, everyone's purpose is to take care of the child. It's not about making sure that I get what I need and making sure to point out what this person or that person did or didn't do. It's about creating an environment where a child can thrive. I think people should foster because we, if you are in a place where you can help someone, do it. I mean, it's, it's your job as a human being, as being you know, part of the community, as being an individual that cares for your community. I think that's you know, why you should foster. Fostering a child is not difficult. Uh, that was the biggest surprise, I think, in all of this. It was easy. Uh, the adjustment was easy. The time frame was easy. Everything was easy. Try not to get tunnel vision of what you're looking for, but maybe you know, keep your options open. Maybe an older child, maybe a child of a different race, different background, things like that, um, because you'll, you know, you'll find that there's so many kids that need a good home, and you could be that home that they need. I think everybody should take it on. I don't think it should be a gay thing. I think that if you are have a home that's loving and supporting, and you know you could help a child, maybe not permanently, but maybe just for a short period of time, 
um, really think about it. Um, you know, and I don't think it has to be a gay couple thing or a straight couple thing. I think it's just, you know, families, I mean, we, we have people in our class, it's like a mother and a grandmother that they're doing this, you know, so it doesn't have to be the traditional what you think of a mom and dad. I mean, kids just need, biggest thing they need is structure and they need stability and they need lots of love. That's it. The fostering system, finally looking at and allowing gays to foster is a, an extremely practical idea. I've seen there's so many children in the system that need love, that need help, that need to be taken care of, that need a safe place with loving people with good heads on their shoulders. But I think that gays are, um, they're so happy to become parents. Certainly there are a lot of gay men who are interested in becoming dads and uh, I think foster care would be a great option for many people. All of the leading national child welfare and social welfare agencies agree that children raised by lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer parents are as happy, healthy, and well-adjusted as children raised by different sex parents. What I would say to couples today, LGBT couples who are looking to raise children but aren't sure, the best way is to follow your heart. The most important thing to do is to be true to who you are. If you're a parent at heart, if you know that you have what it takes to be a parent, to give a part of your life to a young person, then, then do that. Anybody who's looking to become a parent, whether it's adoptive, biological, or foster, the best piece of advice I can give them as a parent and somebody who wasn't, make sure this is what you want to do because having a child is not like returning a puppy the day after Christmas because you've changed your mind. This is a human being that has feelings. When you're a foster parent, you never know what's going to happen from day to day. And, you know, you have to be strong in your relationship. You know, you have to be willing to be a team because there are going to be days when one of you is going to get upset, one of you is going to want to give up, one of you is going to want to say, this isn't worth it and you need to be strong enough to be there. And it does change your relationship, you know, from the moment that you start your relationship, it changes your relationship. And that's, I mean, that, and that comes with being a parent too. But you really have to be prepared to be a team at all times. I, th I think we helped recruit um, several, yeah. several uh, gay parents. I mean, uh, uh, you know, for the most part, people, are, you know, our social ring, um, people, didn't even think about parenting. They saw that we could do it, they, they saw that we were doing it, and um, it, it gave them hope. And, and they followed through, and now uh, several of our friends and mm -hmm. are, are, uh, are doing the foster parent now. And I mean, look, you don't know how amazing it is, and you don't know how possible it is until you do it. I think that even if you're not sure that you wanna have children, the foster care system's a great way to go. It's like test driving a car. You take a child, but I mean, once you bring a child into your home, you're gonna be in love and you're never gonna wanna not have a child, right? Everything happens for a reason, as far as I'm concerned, and I think it's more important to foster than to uh, create a child in any way um, because there's you know so many kids that need a family. I was brought up in a really chaotic situation uh, and knew that I wanted to do something for a kid and kind of get them out of a situation that I was, was similar for me. America's changing, is changing for the better. You know, these children that haven't had homes, that were growing up in group homes, they're now finding homes. You know, this isn't something political, actually. You know, it's, it's for the babies, it's for the children. It's, it's, it's the homes that we're able to give to them and, and how we can contribute. You know, I, I had a lot of uh, exposure to the evangelical people. A lot of them, even some of my previous friends, would probably believe that what I'm doing is, is wrong and hurtful. But, you know, I welcome them into my home. Come sit at my dining table and you see my child and how loved he is and how happy he is and then maybe you might reconsider. There's some people that will never, never accept us, and that's fine. They can live in their little box, and we'll just keep moving forward, loving this child. You know, America is changing. It's changing for the better. Hi, Daddy. Hi, Daddy. I love you.
Blow kisses. To the naysayers of gay people raising children or interracial couples raising children, you know, I don't need to say anything to them because they just have to look at our daughter. She's thriving, she's beautiful, she's happy. And if that's not enough for them, then that's on them. They gotta figure it out on their own time. You know, we're happy where we're at and what we're doing. You go do your thing, we'll do our thing. Oh wow, what's the takeaway and the biggest reward? Just waking up to her beautiful face and his beautiful face every morning and you know, saying this is our family forever and I couldn't be more happier. Good morning, Pop Pop. Say we're going to school. Say I miss you. Say right cute twirls. It's changed everything. And yeah. you know, as far as filling a void, I didn't know there was a void until it was being filled. And that I think is very telling. I think a lot of gay people in general, wow. we carry a, a fear of not being accepted or not being loved. And when this child comes and they look at you unconditionally, it just melts you. Yeah. And it, it breaks down a lot of walls. I wanted to participate in the documentary because I think you know the world needs to know. Um, not so much that gay couples are now allowed to adopt, but that there is such a huge need for adoptive families. And there's kids out there that just, just need to be loved. We kind of thought if it allows one person or a few families to think, hey, you know, this is something I could do. Um, and then more importantly, I love to see, you know, I know that there's states that they don't allow it, and maybe so it'll, it'll open up some people's minds a little bit and realize that, you know, um, families come in all different types of forms, you know, and so that was our biggest reason, I think. No matter how bad my day has been, I walk into the school to pick her up and, you know, that big, huge smile, you know, her telling me about her day, even if it's that she spent the entire day in the little kitchen set playing kitchen all day. Um, you know, it's about having that every day of my life and being able to share that. It, it's hard to explain. I mean, it fills something in you that, it fills a void in your heart that you didn't know existed until that little person came in there. Anybody can be a successful parent. You don't have to be gay or straight. There was obviously a time when I questioned my sexuality and I was, I was so afraid, you know, that I was never going to be a parent. You know, that's what, that's what I thought, you know, I was going to be, you know, just a single person going throughout life um, because of my sexuality. And now I see that it, it, that it is possible. There's a lot of different variations. I think in my own heart has expanded my heart to love more unconditionally and to be selfless and to know that um, there's a bigger picture and I'm not it. And that's a gift that I've received within myself that's been amazing. I mean, I just want people to know that, I mean, from a, you know, that it's possible for you to be able to do this. I mean, it's just, it's not, you don't have to have a lot of money in the world. I mean, you don't have to have a huge bank account. You've you also have to expressed have a, nice a lot house. of a lot of really strong emotions about black men and being good fathers and sure. stepping up to the plate. I agree. Yeah. I mean, and th that too. You know, like I said, you know, I didn't have a father figure in my life for the first ten, year, ten years, and you know, to all the black American single dads out there, you know, kudos to you. But all the other ones who are not doing anything, you know. You're missing out. I would just say do it. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, we discussed it when we started it and I said, look, I said, let's just take it as it comes. We'll start the classes and if at any point it becomes apparent that uh, we're not cut out for this, we'll know. And, you know, nothing ventured, nothing gained. So that's how we went into it. And, um, you know, here we are. <laughs> Here we are with two kids. I agreed to share the story because I'm proud of it. It's the, it's the most monumental thing that I've ever done and I'm really proud of it. I mean this little girl is happy and thriving because of what we are doing with her. You have to ask yourself if you're ready. There are some people that are just too selfish to be a parent. You know, and they know it. That's a good thing. A lot of them will, will know it and admit it. And that's okay. Yeah, that's okay. We all have our own path. But if anybody is thinking about being a parent, 
and they have the means, and they have a partner for a long time, and they just kind of feel like maybe it's just not the right time. Do it. <laughs> There's never a right time, which means it's always the right time. If you have a home and you have a heart, then you should have a child because that's all that really matters. They just want to be loved. And you know, that's all I ever wanted as a child. So I'm sure, you know, that the majority of children in this society, that's all they want is to be loved and be safe. The reward is watching him grow, watching him learn, mm -hmm. watching him discover new things, you know, being able to take him places and introduce him to new parts of the world and having somebody be ecstatic to see you every day at five o'clock. He loves seeing us at five o'clock when we pick him up at daycare. What, what better thing can I do with my life than, than teach and love another human being? You know, and uh, you know, it completes, it completes my legacy for me, being a parent. It has given my life a sense of purpose beyond what I ever could have imagined. And every day I wake up and know why I'm doing what I'm doing. A lot of happiness. Our house is so happy. She runs around screaming happy, all, all of us do. That's we all chase we do. her around the house. And we it, have so much fun. We, um, and there's so much love that we'll say to her, go get your baby. And she'll be hugging on that baby. And, you know, they, they, they do what's been taught to them. So that's the gift we gave her. Well, I can only talk for myself is that, you know, I'm pretty, I could be pretty self-centered. But it wasn't until, and I, don't, and I do a lot of volunteering, I do a lot of good stuff out there, and it wasn't until we had her to really see, yeah, I was pretty self-centered, because I always do what I wanted to do, you know, and now, you can't really, you gotta do what's good for her. And um, you know, so it really takes you out of that self mode and more something bigger because the more stuff you give, good stuff you give her, the more you're giving the universe because if you're gonna give more love to someone, they're gonna bring more love out into this universe. So it's not like you're holding on to that love, you know, you're letting it go. So, I mean, I think it's beautiful. I want gay people to know that they can have families. Not only that they can have families, but they can have cute ones like this. <laughs> Look at this little guy. They can have a family that helps another community. That, that the gay community can actually heal the foster community, you know, by taking on a foster child. And it's exciting. It's exciting because I think that we can promote diversity, we can promote for people to open their minds and open their hearts and realize that we're just a family. We're just another family. I mean, we are the Cleavers. There are so many children that need a place to be. What does it matter who has them? We're all the same. I'm just like anybody else. She's just like anybody else. When people see us being foster parents that other people just jump on the bandwagon and do it because uh, you know, we're helping. And I think this is a great way to, to spark a discussion about it. You know, this world is changing. Get on board. It is changing. I see gay parenting becoming, I, I see it being a huge wave, like the baby boomers, for instance. There was a, a major social event that caused the baby boom generation, and I feel like there is a major social event, be it marriage equality and just this, the gay rights movement that is causing us to realize that we can all start families and it's going to explode into, a, a, into its own generation, the gaby generation. You know, for anyone that, you, you know, you really need to be completely, really secure about who you are and you have to be really okay about being gay and being proud of who you are and uh, et cetera because you will need to come out often and you know depending on where you live or the community you know there might be a lot of other people like you or you might be the only gay in the village and so you know that could be a lot to have to to deal with the way to change hearts and minds is through storytelling 
It's through learning about who we are and who our families are. It's about participating in the fabric of American life. That's how we change hearts and minds over time. I think that being a parent is possibly the most scary thing you can do. You don't know what you're going to do from one day to the next. You don't know what your child is going to do from one day to the next. You have visions and ideas and plans and hopes and aspirations, and it is the most rewarding and uplifting and powerful thing that ever occurs in a parent's life. I've seen the gay dad community evolve significantly from when we became first time dads to now to my experience with gays with kids. I think the biggest thing is that a lot more people understand that they can become dads. Um, if you're in my generation, in the late 40s or so, um, you know, it just wasn't an option. Back in the 90s, it was all about AIDS, and for those of us who are HIV positive, is are we going to live, you know, another year? So no one even thought about planning for the future. And uh, today, it's wonderful. You see all these people who are thinking, "Hey, I can become a dad." Just because I'm a gay man doesn't mean I can't become a dad. And we're giving another opportunity for younger people to say, "Here's another option for your future." My dream.